Hey there, I'm Michael from CodeCloud. Welcome to this lesson from our AWS Cloud Practitioner Certification Course. In this video, we'll help you build a strong foundation in cloud computing with AWS. So if you wanna learn more or go deeper, check out the full course details below and let's get started. In this section, we're gonna talk about the different compute services provided by AWS. Now, when we have an application, we're going to need servers to deploy our applications on. We're gonna need some sort of compute power to actually run our application, run our code. And so we're gonna provision you know, some number of servers to actually deploy our application onto so that they can go ahead and run our code. Now, before AWS came along, the process of deploying a server so that we can actually run our code or run our application was actually a fairly uh, complex process that probably takes a lot of time. So normally what you'd have to do is, first of all, you'd have to find a data center. Now you could build out your data center or you could just rent out a couple of racks in a data center nearby, but you'd have to do one of the two options. Once again, not exactly the simplest of tasks. Then you'd have to purchase a server and that, um, that would involve, you know, actually placing an order for it and having it delivered. Then you'd have to have somebody go into the data center and physically rack a server. And you gotta keep in mind, this process could potentially take days, if not weeks, to not only get the equipment, but then to find somebody that can go to the data center and then rack the server. Then once you're done, you're gonna to have to then install an operating system. And over time, you're gonna to have to watch over the hardware for any potential hardware failures. And if there is some sort of hardware failure, well, then you're gonna to have to re order in a replacement. You're gonna to have to send somebody to the data center to swap out the servers. So very time consuming, it involves multiple people, it involves placing orders. So it's not a trivial task and it's not like something you could just get done overnight. Now getting a server up and running in the cloud is so much easier. AWS has simplified this process. And so if you wanna get a server within AWS, all you have to do is just log into the console and click a couple of buttons and boom, you've got a server. You click a couple more buttons, you got a couple more servers. And then you can go ahead and deploy your application onto these servers, just like you would with any on-prem server. And with AWS, you can, just like with a physical equipment, you can tell uh, what specifications you want. So the number of CPUs, the memory storage that you want for your servers, and AWS is gonna give you a server that meets all of those specifications. And with just a click of a button, you can remove your servers just as easily. So if you find that you don't need as much scale and you don't need as much compute power, you can actually remove servers just as easily. And you're only gonna pay for the servers that you need. And so the service that's responsible for providing these servers in the cloud is called EC2. So EC2 is Amazon's elastic compute service. And so this service provides secure, resizable compute capacity in the cloud. So it's just like getting your own um, you know, virtual server within AWS. And so it allows you to provision a server within just minutes. So you click a button and you'll get a server up and running within just a couple of minutes. So instead of having to wait days potentially weeks to order a server and have somebody rack it in a physical data center. You click a button, within minutes, you got it up and running. Now, as I've mentioned, within the cloud, when you deploy um, resources, in this case, we'll focus on EC2 because that's what we're talking about. Uh, somebody else is also going to be deploying EC2 instances and there's a potential for both of your EC2 instances to be on the same AWS server. In fact, um, one single AWS physical server could potentially be housing EC2 instances for hundreds if not thousands of customers. And the way that it's able to do this is by using the concept of virtual machines. So the server runs a specific application that allows it to run virtualized instances of an operating system so that you can actually run multiple little mini servers within one physical server. And the way that we isolate our different EC2 instances is by making use of VPCs. So VPCs will allow, just, will allow us to logically isolate each customer's infrastructure so that even though they're running on the same physical equipment, that's okay, we won't be able to talk to their servers or their EC2 instances because of VPCs and their default rules. So when you install a physical server, when you want to go and install an operating system on the server, you would install or you would insert the uh, the disk that it contains whatever operating system you want to use. If you want to use Windows, you'd have a Windows installer disk. Or if you want to use Linux, then you'd get the Linux installer disk. You could also install it using a USB drive, but you would have to insert it and then um, boot from there. How do you do this with EC2 instances? Because remember, this is running in the cloud, so we can't physically insert any disks. Well, this is where Amazon machine images come into play or AMIs. 
So an AMI is an image that provides the information required to launch an EC2 instance. So you take the AMI, and then from there, you can deploy multiple identical EC2 instances. So the AMI is like the blueprint that contains information um, such as like what operating system and what software packages that should be installed on each one of the EC2 instances. And we can use this AMI to deploy as many EC2 instances that we want. And they're all going to be identical because they're all coming from the same AMI. So there's going to be different AMIs for different operating systems and for different services and features, right? So if you want to deploy a Linux EC2 instance, you could just grab one of the Linux AMIs that's going to automatically boot up a EC2 instance running some flavor of Linux. So what I like to do is I like to think of AMIs as the installer disk used for installing on a new server. So you take the AMI and it kind of acts like the installer disk for your EC2 instance. So whatever the AMI is, that's what's going to get installed on your EC2 instance essentially. And that's what your EC2 instance is going to run. And the great part about AMIs is that they can actually be customized. So you can add your application source code into the AMI so that when you deploy your EC2 instance, your source code's already in there. It's not just an operating system. You can customize it to add anything you want. You can add in all the dependencies. You can even customize the operating system's firewall rules ahead of time so that once you deploy your EC2 instance, you don't have to touch it. You don't have to configure it. Everything's already baked into that image. So let's now talk about instance types. So EC2 provides a wide selection of instance types optimized to fit different use cases. Uh, and so you can think of instance types kind of like um, when you're shopping through a catalog for a specific server, you're going to look for a server that has all the specs you want. You need uh, a server with a CPU that has uh, 25 cores, then you got to look for one. If you need 64 gigs of RAM, then you got to find a model that has 64 gigs of RAM. And that's what instance types are. So instance types have a varying combination of different amounts of CPU, memory, storage, and networking capacity. So I like to just think of them as uh, instance types as just different types of server models that you can select from. So Amazon gives you this beautiful catalog of different EC2 instance types, and you just select the ones that you want. So if you want one that has 3 gigahertz CPU with 4 gigabytes of memory, you can get that. If you want one with 4 gigahertz and 8 gigabytes of memory, or 2 gigahertz and 2 gigabytes of memory, you could probably find a model that fits pretty closely to the specs that you're interested in. So let's go over the, the different instance types. So we've got general purpose. And so this is meant to provide a good balance of the varying specs of a server. So it's going to provide a good balance of compute, so a good balance of CPU, memory, and networking resources. Um, it can be used for a variety of different workloads. It's meant to be flexible. That's why it's called general purpose. And it's ideal for applications that use resources roughly in equal proportions. Then from there, we have compute optimized. And you could probably already guess what this is meant for, but it's optimized for compute heavy applications, thus the name compute optimized. So it's going to contain high performance CPU. So anytime you need applications that do a lot of number crunching, a lot of CPU intensive tasks, that's what you're going to want to use the compute optimized. So this is going to be great for batch processing workloads, media transcoding, machine learning, and gaming servers. The next instance type that we have is memory optimized. So this is going to be for delivering fast performance for memory intensive workloads, which is great for databases that um, need higher memory requirements. And then we have storage optimized, which is just like its name is going to be optimized for storage. And so it's going to be great for workloads that require, uh, you know, high sequential read and write access to large data sets on local storage. And it can deliver tens of thousands of low latency random IO operations per second. Then finally, the last instance type is accelerated computing. So this utilizes hardware accelerators to perform expensive calculations. And so this is great for graphics processing and data pattern matching. And so, you know, if you guys are having a trouble remembering all of the different instance types, just remember there's going to be an, you have the general purpose instance type, and then you're going to have one for each of the different specs of a server, one for memory, one uh, memory optimized, one for CPU. So you can have the, the compute optimized one for storage, and then finally accelerated computing. So it's actually not that hard to remember. Just understand there's going to be one type for each one of the different aspects of, uh, specifications you'd pay for a server. So now let's talk about the different pricing options. So there's different ways you can pay for your EC2 instances, and you can select which one will help you minimize your costs. And there's going to be different ideal options depending on how you utilize your workloads. But if you don't understand everything that we cover here, that's okay. We're going to reiterate the same information in the billing section of this course. 
So the first pricing option is on-demand pricing. And the whole idea with on-demand pricing is you pay for the compute capacity by the hour. So every hour your server's running, you pay some amount of money. And you only build when instances are running. Keep in mind, you'll still be charged for storage attached to instances even when they're powered off. Uh, but you're basically paying for the servers that you use. And then if you delete the servers, you don't have to pay for them. The great part about on-demand is that there's no upfront payment or long-term commitment. So you could start it up, use it for one hour, and then just shut it down. Or you could start it up and let it run for years if you'd like. Uh, but this is great for short-term, irregular, and unpredictable workloads because they can be spun up and spun down however you'd like. And finally, uh, just to reiterate, when you're using on-demand pricing, your EC2 instances are going to be running on shared hosts. So you're going to be running your EC2 instances on a server alongside other customers' EC2 instances. It's just something to keep in mind. The next pricing model for EC2 instances is spot pricing. And to go over that, we need to go over how EC2 servers are set up. So we have so Amazon is going to have a whole bunch of physical servers that are going to act kind of like a pool of servers that will run your EC2 instances. And so they could have any number of EC2 instances running on each physical server. Now the the issue comes with, uh, you know, let's say we have um, a 20, uh, a 64 gigabit model server. Well, if all of the EC2 instances running on that server only use 20 gigs, well, they're now they're wasting 42 gigs of RAM. So there's a lot of spare capacity, both from a compute perspective and from a memory perspective. And Amazon doesn't like to waste that because ultimately they're paying for these servers. Whether you're running all of the EC2 instances to the full, fullest capacity of that server, or you're running nothing on it, it costs the same amount of money to run it. So they wanna, they wanna maximize the usage of their servers. They want them fully utilized 100%. So what they do is they offer this spare capacity to be purchased at a discounted rate. So this spare capacity is referred to as spot pricing. And so any spare capacity that Amazon has, they're gonna offer it at a discounted rate so that you can use it so that all of their servers are 100% utilized as often as possible. Now, spot instances aren't recommended for all types of workloads. They're recommended for specific use cases. So applications, first of all, need to have flexible start and end times. These should be applications that need to probably have lower compute prices. So maybe on-demand pricing isn't the best, so you can make use of spot pricing to get a cheaper rate. And it's not suitable for workloads that can tolerate interruptions. So if the application uh, you know, would be crippled by getting interrupted unnecessarily, this isn't the best pricing model. You shouldn't use it for that. The next pricing model I want to discuss is called reserve pricing. So reserve pricing allows you to um, sign a long-term agreement to use a certain amount of compute power and get, it, get that compute power at a discounted rate. So they offer, you know, one or three year contracts. And during that time, you'll actually get to have a lower rate for your EC2 instances versus using traditional on-demand pricing. Now, what's important to understand is when you purchase a reserved instance, you're not actually buying an instance, right? It's not like there's one server that's always running and you're just getting at a discount rate. Instead, you're merely committing to using an on-demand instance for a certain period of time, the one or three year contract. And so when you deploy a on-demand instance with a matching attribute to the reservation, it'll be charged at the reserved price and not the default on-demand pricing. So let me explain how that works. So when you go to use reserve pricing, you're going to get a reserve instance. You're going to specify a couple of attributes for your reservation. So you're going to say, okay, I want an M3 large instance. Like that's the size of the instance. I want it deployed in US, uh, US East one um, using a Linux platform. And so these are the specifications for your reservation. So when you deploy an EC2 instance that matches those specs, like this instance, right? It's got M3 large, US East one, Linux, it matches all the attributes. We get it at the reserved price because it matches that attribute. However, if we deploy a different instance using a different type, like M4 large, well, it's not, it doesn't match our reservation, so we pay the full price. So that's how reserve pricing works. It's not actually like a specific reserved instance. It's just that we're saying that any instance that matches our reservation specifications, we'll, we will get it at the reserved price. If you're ready to take your cloud skills to the next level, don't miss our complete AWS Cloud Practitioner certification course on CoCloud. With hands-on labs, interactive games, and all the guidance you need to ace the exam, you'll be well on your way to certification. So click the link below to join the course today.